thing that I've never seen in a science fiction novel is the, the quest for the, the meaning of the universe. Here we right. have Arthur Dent and Ford Perfect being thrust into outer space, hitchhiking their way across the galaxy, encountering a, a civilization that has tried to grapple with a computer that can find the meaning of existence. Right. Could you explain how you came to that and then what was the final answer that the computer found? Um, I mean, very often, um, and unless you understand everything that surrounds an answer, you're not going to understand the answer it, itself. And in this case, nobody actually even knew what the question was supposed to be. Um, so what happens, uh, just to tell, recap the story briefly, is that they build this gigantic supercomputer. Of course, I didn't know in those days that a su supercomputer would have to be very small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's interesting going to. I, I, I visited uh, a few years ago a friend who was working at Digital Productions in Los Angeles, where they were working on a Cray supercomputer, which was really quite a small thing. I mean, it would sort of fit in this sort of space, though the cooling plant for it would fill a whole building. Um, and uh, the point is the speed with which it has to operate, the length of each wire becomes significant. Light may be tra uh, electrons may be traveling along it at 186,000 miles per hour, uh, uh, but, um, that, uh, sorry, 186,000 miles per second, but that is, that is actually a little too slow for the computer. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, uh, so, so we, we now know, you know, as computers get more and more powerful, they're kind of going to have to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But anyway, so I made that mistake. Um, so they ask it to calculate the, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And it says, okay, it'll take me seven and a half million years of computation. And, um, uh, and, and eventually they come back, and it says, yes, there is an answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And they say, are you going to tell us? And it says, yes, but you're not going to like it. And eventually it says, well, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is 42. And... Um, uh, they suddenly realized they hadn't actually worked out what the question was. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and without knowing that, the answer 42 actually isn't going to help you very much. But it seemed to me, I'm, as much as anything else, it was, you know, I, I just liked the joke that, that it was mm. going to be a number and nobody would know mm -hmm. what that was. Mm -hmm. Trying to find what the number was was interesting because um, I decided if you're doing, if you're doing a a joke that involves a number, um, then the sort of knee-jerk reaction of, of comedy writers is to put in a sort of slightly peculiar number, like it'll be sort of 17 and 3 eighths or something. And I thought, no, 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 that's silly, because here the whole joke is that it is a number, and if you put a silly number in there, it's going to defuse the joke. So it's got to be a very, very ordinary number. So I thought, how do you find out <coughs> what an ordinary number is? So I thought, well, the first thing is it can't be an odd number. Now, the, there is exactly the same number of odd numbers as there are even numbers, but there's something odd about them. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, well, it can't, so it can't be an odd number, it can't be a prime number, it can't be... It's got to be an everyday sort of number. You know, you can divide six into it, you can divide seven into it. It's, it's, the, it's, it's just a sort of ordinary, everyday number. And that was... You know, people have speculated the whole time, why did I choose that number? And it was just the most ordinary one I could come up, come up with. Mm -hmm. So the meaning of the universe is 42. Right. But, you know, from a physicist's point of view, this is kind of interesting because in superstring theory, which is supposedly the theory of the entire universe, the magic number is 26. That the theory predicts that our universe is in 26 dimensions. However, no one knows why. It's just, it just pops out of the equations that we, here we have this number 26 staring at us in the face. And many physicists have commented that in your series, the number 42 jumps out. Right. And yet, uh, it seems that the meaning of existence does seem to be bound by strange numbers that are actually even and strange numbers that come at you that for which there's no explanation. Right. <laughs> Let me ask you a personal question. How right. is it that somebody who's into comedy writing, somebody who's into advanced physics, somebody who's into science fiction, came out with that strange combination? It had probably something to do with what happened when you were 15 years of age. How did it all come together? Well, I remember ages ago having a talk to somebody who was um, a, a, a researcher in an arcane field in physics. We discovered that we thought we did that I, as a comedy writer, and he, as a, as a research physicist, did a very similar job. Because there's, 
something that we both do, which is sifting through all the sort of data, all the information, all the ideas, trying to find things that unexpectedly correlate from here to here, correspondences that, that are completely unexpected. And this is certainly what you do in, in, in comedy writing. You're, you're trying to see things in, in by shifting some perspective, shifting some variable somewhere that suddenly makes two things that uh, were apparently completely unalike suddenly appear to be alike, uh, and appear to be alike because in some fundamental way they are. And it's, it's always those moments of, of sudden, rather startled recognition that give you particularly good moments in comedy. And you will see instantly how that obviously applies to scientific research. You're actually um, trying to find patterns, you're trying to find correspondences, things that connect with each other that you didn't expect to. Um, so I think it's not, not unnatural that a, um, a mind which has a bent to do one will also be fascinated by the other. So the serendipity of the scientist, right, the, the leaps yep. of logic, the fantastic right. leaps of logic that an Einstein or a Newton would have, are also the, the basic science that, that comedy writers approach I the think craft. so, yes, yes. Well, mm -hmm. cer certainly, certainly the way I, I approach comedy, um, that's true. I mean, obviously it's different for different people. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's, I suppose, I mean, writing that kind of comedy has also allowed me to just to invent and speculate um, with an immense amount of freedom. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that I've always loved doing. And it's, it's, as I say, it's also the thing which is the natural resource of somebody who's a scientist, you know, the need to invent and speculate about ideas. Um, and you know, doing writing science fiction comedy is, is the ideal way of, of, of putting the two together. Um, and I, I have to say, that though I, um, oh, you know, I had to abandon serious scientific training, you know, when I was uh, 15 or whatever it was, uh, and felt very frustrated by that for a long time. Um, something that's come sort of galloping to my rescue, uh, in one way, has been the yeah, has been personal computers, um, because um, uh, I have I have a house full of Macintoshes, <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I I spend an awful lot of time uh, I mean, apart from writing, you know, doing bits of programming, following ideas, and seeing how things work. And I, I I've learned an awful lot from it. Um, uh, my publishers always say that they th think it's rather alarming displacement activity. You know, it's, it's the it's the uh, sort of modern a modern writer's equivalent of sharpening your pencils every morning before you get down to work, <laughs> and then cleaning the fridge, <laughs> and then having a bath. Uh, instead, I just do it all on the computer. Um, but um, um, I found that, um, I mean, for instance, one of the reasons I think one of the things that held me back. Slightly, when I was uh, uh, when I used to do um, you know, maths and physics uh, as, at a junior level, um, was I was very good at the concepts, um, but I was, I mean, I, I had sort of number blindness at one level in that, you know, give me a column of figures to add up, and I would never get them to come to the same number each time, and this used to drive me crazy because it was a terrible frustration that I would know, I would have grasped the concept and not be able to make the numbers work on paper. And of course, if you're using a computer, you can, you can explore the concepts to your heart's content, because it will take care of the numbers. Now, any mathematician will say to me in response to that, ah, but if you, if you don't have an instinctive feel for basic arithmetic, then, then you're always going to be somewhat of a, a limited mathematician, because all the really great mathematicians have, have an absolute instinctive grasp of basic arithmetic and you can't really do one properly without the other but there's a gray area in which I certainly fall um, uh, that is fascinated by concepts and can play with concepts but kind of need the machine it needs the machine to add up four and seven and get eleven every time <laughs> <laughs>